There is a troubling report out that President Obama may have supported the idea of restricting free speech. Well, that story dating back to his days at Harvard Law School in the early 90s. So does the president back the First Amendment in full? Fox News senior judicial analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano is here, and that was your assignment, Judge. Look it was, into it. It was my assignment to look, uh, to look into it. Look, people, I can tell you this as a former law student mm -hmm. and former law school professor, sometimes say wacky and provocative things when they're in law school just to test the idea. But this, he, he was the editor in chief of the Harvard Law Review, sure. which is the most prestigious position a student can have in all law schools in the United States, arguably. And he was sitting on a panel with a future Supreme Court judge. Justice, then judge, now justice, Stephen Breyer, That's and they right. were talking about whether or not it's appropriate to restrict speech on campuses. This is 20 years ago, and the topic of campus speech codes are being hotly debated. The sure. president supported them. This supports the idea of authority restricting speech in order to prevent the listener of the speech from being offended by it. Well, let's take a look at the quotation from 1991 out of the Harvard Law Yearbook. Quote, here it is, 13 words. I don't see a lot of conservatives getting upset if minorities feel silenced. This was an effort uh, that was being debated at Harvard Law School, which was never adopted by the law school, though then student Barack Obama was apparently in favor of it. To, make, to restrict, uh, to to restrict, restrict of speech. offensive speech. Speech deemed offensive to certain to, to certain groups. In that case, it would be minorities. It would be uh, racial, ethnic, gender, uh, sexual orientation uh, minorities. You would think that the future president of the United States would be for free speech for everybody. You would think so, but this is the same president who, as you may know, signed legislation that permits the Secret Service to restrict free speech in any area that he goes to. Mm -hmm. So if he's driving through your town and you have a sign that says re-elect Obama, the Secret Service will leave you alone. If you have a sign that says, you know, vote for Mitt Romney and the sign gets too close to the president's car, the Secret Service can restrict that speech because of its content. That's the problem with the thinking in this president. Again, this was 20 years ago, and he was a student, but it seems to be consistent with what he believes today. Very interesting. Judge Andrew Napolitano, thanks for breaking that down. There's so much to watch for. No kid. <laughs> no doubt. Well, right now, Jerry Sandusky heading to prison for what is essentially a life sentence. A 68-year-old former Penn State coach sentenced to at least 30 years in prison. Judge Andrew Napolitano, Fox News senior judicial analyst, joins us. We all know the backstory, Judge. We yes. knew that he could be sentenced to upwards of 400 years in prison. So why 30? Well, you know, I, I don't know why the judge came up with these numbers, but I know that Pennsylvania has a, an antiquated system of sentencing. In, in many states, like, say, New Jersey, where I sat as a judge, for a crime like this, you would sentence the person to life without parole, period, whether they live five years or 50 years. Uh, to a person who's 68 years old, there is no difference between 60 years and 400 years in jail. It but, feels different, though, Judge. Well, it sounds sure. different, but people should understand that 30 years to 60 years means he is not eligible even to ask for parole until he has served the full 30 years. So he would have to wait until he's 98 years old before he could ask for parole, if he ever lived that long. That's probably the thinking of this uh, judge. The other thinking in the judge, and again, I'm trying to get inside the judge's head, is that as horrendous as this crime is, you might save the 400 years for a mass murderer. Hmm. Because as okay. you say, it sounds worse. It's it sounds a, heavier. It's such a difficult story to, to wrap your head around in, yes. in, in so many different aspects. It and is. we heard from Jerry Sandusky from prison in a, in a recorded statement. And I'm going to play a little bit for our viewers now. This is part of his reasoning of why he ended up where he did today. Take a listen. A young man who is dramatic, a veteran accuser, and always sought attention started everything. He was joined by a well orchestrated effort of the media, investigators, the system, Penn State, psychologists, civil attorneys, and other accusers. They won. The victims certainly heard that sentiment. The judge had to hear that sentiment as well. How would that impact you if you heard that type of explanation and really no remorse? Well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't impact me at all, and I don't think it impacted this judge. I mean, essentially, uh, Mr. Sandusky is re-arguing the case and is suggesting why the witnesses should not have been believed. That's history. The jury has spoken. 
The judge has heard very competent professional applications to set aside the verdict for the very reasons that Sandusky just argued, and the judge rejected those arguments. So the judge is not in a position now to hear arguments that he should have been acquitted. He's only in a position to hear arguments about the harm that he's caused and the reasons he's going to be in jail. Judges have a tendency of letting criminal defendants, especially ones they know are going to go to, uh, to jail for a long time, say whatever they want, just to get it out of their system. In this particular case, what Sandusky said is he relevant because you can't argue guilt or innocence sure. at this point and inappropriate because the judge can't even take it into account so it's just a waste of time. Real quick here there's also complaints by Sandusky and his team that they did not have enough time to prepare for trial and that this really could go to appeal that are we going to see that judge what yes. should we expect? Yes I think that's a legitimate basis for uh, appeal I don't know why the judge did this but in a case like this the defense can't prepare until they get the government's file he let the government give them their file the night before the trial started. That's not really enough time. But whether it's worthy of, of saying the whole trial was unfair and, and the, the verdict is tainted is for an appellate court to decide. How long will that take? Probably about a year for them to either to uphold or reverse this. I think they'll uphold it. And, and we do have a couple executives as well from Penn State on trial, facing trial in the next several months, so the story will continue. Judge, yes. uh, nice to have your perspective. Thank you very much. Pleasure, Jenna. No matter what we talk about. That's right. I always <laughs> appreciate it. A Fox News alert to the Supreme Court now and a case that could turn four decades of affirmative action on its head. The judges today heard arguments in a lawsuit involving a college student who claims that she did not get into the University of Texas because she's white. Fox's Shannon Green was in court during the arguments. She joins us live now. Shannon, tell us the latest. Well, Allison, it was a very hot bench today, meaning there was a lot of tough questioning across the board, and it all started because a teenager decided she would take on a fight that brought her here all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Abigail Fisher is sur uh, suing the University of Texas at Austin, saying its use of race in its admissions criteria cost her, a white female, a spot in the freshman class. Her attorney says she could wind up proving that one person could change the face of higher education across the entire country. I'm very proud to be with this young lady. She had the courage and the perseverance to stand up for equality, to stand up for what was right, for the stand up for the guarantee that's fundamental to all of us, that we're entitled to the equal protection of the laws. The justices, minus Justice Elena Kagan, who recused herself, showed a lot of passion on both sides. Chief Justice John Roberts, joined by Justices Alito and Scalia, hammered the university's attorney relentlessly, repeatedly asking, where do we draw the line? When does the university say, okay, we've reached the appropriate makeup of minorities, now we're going to stop considering race in the process? Still, the school's president believes it had the winning argument today. We believe the educational benefit of diversity are so important that they're worth fighting for all the way to the United States Supreme Court. Our lawyers this morning effectively made the case to the justices that diversity, ethnic and otherwise, benefits all of the students on our campus. And the man who had everyone's eyes on him today was Justice Anthony Kennedy. He is expected to be the swing justice in this particular case. He has said in the past that he understands the use of race in trying to uh, right past wrongs and make sure there is diversity in our colleges and workplaces. But he's expressed also very real concerns about how to do that without discriminating against others in the process. Uh, we'll have to wait and see a few months or so probably until we know what he decides. But I got to tell you, in the courtroom today, he expressed a lot of skepticism about the policy the University of Texas at Austin is currently using. Uh, interesting. All right, Shannon Breen, thanks so much for that front row on what, what went on today. So some of the country's top legal experts have predicted this conservative-leaning court could end up killing affirmative action. What kind of legal implications does this case have for the future? Here now, Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew DiPolitano. Judge, great to see Allison, you. Allison, good to be with what you, What is the significance of what's going on today? The significance of this case is it will either uphold a decision of the Supreme Court back in 2003, which permits state-owned schools to take race into account when they formulate their admissions policies, or it will change that law. If it upholds it, then this will happen all over the country, and people will lose opportunities to gain admission to schools owned by the state based on race. And 100 years of jurisprudence, which basically said, we fought the Civil War, and we enacted the amendments right after the Civil War to keep race out of the government's menu of decision-making processes. All of that history will be nullified with respect to admission to state-owned schools. On the other hand, I don't think the court would have decided to hear this case if it wasn't going to change 
the law because it just ruled on it in 2003. It usually waits a very long time before it will reverse itself. So this will be, I think, a reversal from eight years ago, and I think the majority of this court will say, you can't use race, you can't use gender, you couldn't take, let, not let her in because she's a, a woman. You can't use age. You can't use race. These are immutable characteristics of birth, and they have no place in our society for the state, not a private school, but for the state to be deciding who can take advantage of assets that the state owns. So do you think that Chief Justice Roberts or just the justices as a whole were looking for an opportunity to review their policy on this? You know, there's a lot of scuttlebutt in, uh, in Washington, and Shannon uh, knows this better than I, uh, that Chief Justice Roberts is looking to redeem himself with traditionalists uh, after he switched his vote, we believe, and, and voted to uphold Obamacare back in uh, the spring. But in fairness to the Chief Justice, the Supreme Court agreed to take this case long before it ruled on the Affordable Health Care Act back in, back in the spring. But I do believe that there is now a majority on the court to say race is out of the question, one way or the other, whether it's benign or whether it's, uh, it's horrific. The government cannot use race to make a decision. The reason I believe that is because Justice O'Connor has been replaced by uh, Justice uh, Alito, who probably would not uh, have uh, sided with the Michigan case 2,000 years ago. Justice Kennedy was in the minority uh, in, in the 2003 case. So I think the votes are there to say to state schools, get out of this business of trying to formulate your classes based on race. Formulate them based on merit. So hereafter, we would have to be colorblind, at least in terms of admissions. Uh, yes. Judge Andrew Napolitano, great to see you. Pleasure, Allison. Well, that devastating and frankly historic oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico is today causing new problems along the Gulf South, more than two years after the disaster happened. According to the reporting of the U.S. Coast Guard, there's an oil sheen that turned up near the sunken Deepwater Horizon rig last month, and it matches the oil from the 2010 disaster. They tested it. It does not pose a risk to the Gulf shoreline. The Coast Guard reports that BP and Transocean, which own the rig, could be liable for this new oil. In the meantime, BP is apparently close to a multi-billion dollar settlement in the Justice Department's federal lawsuit over that spill. That's according to the reporting of the Wall Street Journal, which again is owned by our parent company. Remember, the explosion killed 11 people, injured more than a dozen others, and unleashed some 200 million gallons of oil into the Gulf of Mexico. Let's take this to the judge. Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, is back in our New York studios. A settlement, uh, is it a good, it, what's the situation here, Judge? Well, there's, there's two uh, cases that the federal government has against BP. One is a threatened criminal case. They have not yet indicted what? the corporation, but they're basically oh. holding a, an indictment in their hands saying, we'll right. file this tomorrow. And the other is a uh, lawsuit that the feds have filed under several federal statutes, which lets the federal government sue in behalf of property owners whose property has been damaged by the oil spill. Uh, the Wall Street Journal reports this morning that both cases will be settled, that BP will cough up billions in criminal fines as well as billions in compensation. Now, the numbers sound ridiculous because the Wall Street Journal, and just like anybody else, doesn't know exactly what the numbers are. They are somewhere between six billion and 21 billion but the Wall Street Journal sources and they they appear to be reliable have have indicated that they are very close to some number between six and 21 and whatever it is uh, BP will pay it of course they won't actually have to pay it Shep because you may remember they coughed up 20 billion within a month after the spill uh, because the vice president literally put his arm on the then CEO of BP saying how about 20 billion now so the feds will just take this money and disperse it and, and that money would go to the states Alabama Mississippi Louisiana all along Florida all well, along the well without there. without uh, getting too much in the weeds there are two federal statutes one lets the federal government give it to the states for all their damages damages to state property and say reduction in in taxes paid by people who lost income so they didn't pay taxes to the state the other statute only lets the oh, federal government reimburse the states that have actually spent money to clean up the environment only one state in the Gulf Coast has spent enough money to re to demand reimbursement for cleaning up the environment that's Louisiana but the other states there Texas Alabama the great state of uh, Mississippi uh, here, here. also want some money from the feds my guess is the feds will distribute that money to the states the feds will collect a lot of money from BP somewhere closer to the 20 billion end and this case will be over
over, over and done with, and that's it. And then BP can move on, do more drilling, and make more billions, right? Well, well yes. And what you said at the outset here is very significant because the, the people who received money from BP agreed never to sue it again for anything having to do mm, with this. Wasn't that nice? They didn't know that there might be another spill or another sheen coming from the original spill. They won't be able to sue mm. for any damages from that. Yes, yeah, stand by for news. Judge Napolitano, great to see you. Thank you. Good to see you, Chef. Well, thousands of military members in Ohio may not be able to cast their vote on November 6th because of a court ruling that halted a series of early voting laws implemented by the state, namely one that allowed military members five extra days of early in-person voting. Well, now Ohio leaders are appealing to the Supreme Court, but will a decision be made in time for this election? Joining us right now, that guy whose forehead you just saw, Fox News senior <laughs> judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Did I get in the way of that camera? It's, uh, it's fine. It's fine. It's live TV. How many thousandth time? There you go. And uh, Apparently, they're asking the Supreme Court now to step in at the 11th hour to try to change this thing right. because military people are not getting a little extra time to vote. He, here's what happened. The governor of Ohio, whom we all know, he used to work here, John yeah. Kasich, realized the problems that military people have in voting and how it takes them longer to get the absentee ballot to where they are to, to sign the ballot and to get it back. Sure. So he induced the Ohio legislature to give military personnel, full-time on-duty military personnel, an additional five days in which to vote. Right. That's five more days than civilians have to vote. So the Obama campaign challenged this and said, if you're going to give the military five more days to vote, you got to give everybody five more days to vote. And a federal district court judge said to the Obama campaign, you're right. And a federal appeals court said to the district court judge, you're right. And now Governor Kasich and Ohio leadership is going to appeal this to the Supreme Court. I think it's kind of late in the day for the Supreme Court of the United States to be addressing campaign law when ballots have to be printed and so people So no extra know. help for our members of the military if you're registered in Ohio. Notwithstanding the best of intentions by the people in Ohio, no extra help. Now, if they had given everybody five more days, there'd be no case. Right. Because the, the Constitution, as Kilmeade would tell you, right. has this thing in it called the Equal Protection Clause, which basically means you have to treat similarly situated, the government yeah. right. must treat similarly situated people in a similar way. And why would, uh, you know, why would the Obama administration want to uh, come up against that is because, you know, if you look at the polls, military people tend to vote for Mitt Romney, or at least that's what they're I saying. I think almost double. I think the Obama administration is willing to use the court system to keep people who they think will vote for uh, Governor Romney and Congressman Ryan from doing so. And you're probably right. This is a generalization, but it's probably true with respect to the military. So right. I don't know the outcome. My prediction is the Supreme Court will not hear this three weeks uh, from Election Day, and it will stand as it is. So if you're in the military in Ohio, you have to, you, you actually have the weekend in which to vote. Right. You have Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, like everybody else. That extra five days, which have gone to the previous Monday, gone. All right. Uh, you're gone, too. Uh, Andrew Napolitano, thank you very much <laughs> Listen, for dropping watch it. The Yankees had Biden last night. Oh, uh, my goodness. Yankees lost, in, uh, and now there'll be a game five tonight. Uh, yes, Judge. unfortunately. Thank you very much. Biden lost, too. Mm -hmm. oh, what a We've been it talking about that. It was what close. A Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> how do you really feel? <laughs> okay, uh, and that's how we end the segment. <laughs> Thanks very much, Judge. Yep. Things are heating up in Florida after the state's Board of Education unveiled some controversial new education standards based on race. Whites and Asians being held to higher standards than blacks and Hispanics. The Board of Education defending their decision. You start at different places, and so, I mean, you could say that, but how realistic is that to say that? Then that, I think, it really puts you up for failure when you expect that everybody is going to be at the same place at the same time when they didn't start at the same place. That's not the answer. No matter what the problem is, the answer is not making a kid feel inferior because you take that kid and you carry them further back. And here's a better question. Is this even legal? Let's talk to somebody who knows. He's studied a lot of stuff. Senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Good morning to you. Good morning, guys. I've never seen one like this and couldn't find anything like it uh, in, in researching Supreme Court or federal court decisions. Right. When I read this story as a newsreader yesterday, I didn't even... I mean, I questioned the validity of it because it seems in 2012 like we're going back in time 50 years to be discussing race-based education. It does seem that way. I mean, the general rule of thumb is 
that the government cannot use race right. in its menu of, uh, of decision-making factors. All right, and Judge, let's take a look at this controversial suggestion, proposal. By the year 2018, the educators down in Florida say that 90% of Asian students should be proficient at reading. 88% white students should be proficient, Hispanic 81, and 74% black. And then you look at the math goals, and there they are right there as well. One of the problems, Judge, is it perpetuates stereotypes. And that is exactly what the 14th Amendment was ratified in order to prevent the government from doing. The government must level the playing field and give everybody an equal opportunity, and it cannot perpetuate racial stereotypes. It's a quota. It's a quota, and it, it makes it very difficult for young people who are in some of those uh, ethnic groups to try and succeed when the state has said you only have to do this percentage. You don't even have to make well, it to 100%. I think it's so absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it flies in the face of the American dream and just the psyche of a child when you're already telling them in kindergarten you're not going to be as good as your white or your Asian friend. These are very powerful arguments against it, but the legal arguments against it are it is based on race and the 14th Amendment prohibits the state of Florida and all states and all governments from making decisions based on race. Now we have exceptions to that. Sure. We have a 2003 Supreme Court decision that says the states can make decisions based on race with respect to admissions policy for state Owned universities. That may change. That case was reargued right. uh, just last week before the Supreme Court. Right. This will require somebody to challenge it and for a court to decide this is not appropriate Ex under the 14th Amendment. Exit question, real fast. But you don't think this is going to ever see the no, light of day? No, I think this is so unacceptable in present society that this Board of Education will rescind it before, uh, they before federal courts can review it. It's wow. crazy. It Andrew is. Napolitano, great to see you. Have a good rest of the day. Pleasure, guys. You too. <laughs> From Arizona to the highest court in the land, the United States Supreme Court set to weigh in on Arizona's voter ID law enacted in 2004. The high court will decide whether Arizona can require residents to show proof of citizenship before voting. Judge Andrew Napolitano, Fox News senior judicial analyst, here with more on that. So the, the voters of Arizona said... If you're going to vote, we want you to show identification, prove that you're an American citizen, right? Well, there, there's, there's two things here. The Arizona statute, which requires that you show that you are registered to vote in Arizona, has not been disturbed. So the so-called voter ID, which about a half dozen states have, one of which is Arizona, is the law. And uh, people at the polling places this November in Arizona can ask for identification. The issue is you can get identification in Arizona without being an American citizen, and you can register to vote in Arizona without proving that you're an American citizen. So here's the problem. If you show up to to register at a polling facility, not on election day, but in advance as the law requires, you will have to show proof of citizenship. But if you mail in a registration form, you do not have to show proof of citizenship. Why? Because the mail-in registration is regulated by a federal statute enacted in the Clinton years, and the actual in-person registration is controlled by the state which forces you to prove you're an American. What kind of system allows two different rules for registering to vote, a, depending on whether you do it by mail or a, in person? A wacky, crazy system, especially one where the Constitution specifically gives to the states, as a check on federal power, the decision to regulate voting. But in the Clinton years, Bill Clinton and a Democratic Congress modeled this register by mail procedure after something Governor Michael Dukakis, of all people, had done in Massachusetts. And the Democrats thought, you know, well, we'll get more people to register and they'll vote for us because we made it easier for them to register if they register by mail. Because the federal government prescribed that, because the Constitution says when the federal government and the state governments clash, the federal government shall supersede, that's why this California appeals court sided with the feds and said the state can't interfere. If you vote, if you register by mail, you don't have to prove you're a citizen. That's what the Supreme Court re agreed to review yesterday. Not in time for the presidential election, but certainly in time for whatever elections Arizona has next year. So taking out your crystal ball, because I know you spend a lot of time on the bench gazing into your crystal ball, are you making predictions as to how this Supreme Court will rule? I think that the Supreme Court will interfere with this statute. That is the federal statute. I think the Supreme Court will basically say what Arizona is attempting to do is a baseline that every state should do. 
assure that only American citizens can vote. And the federal government never intended to interfere with this when that statute was written back in the 90s when Bill Clinton was in the White House. I really believe that. Otherwise, the Supreme Court, doesn't, which doesn't like to get involved in election law unless it has to, wouldn't get involved in this one. Judge Andrew Napolitano. It's going to be interesting to see what they decide. Thank yes, you. Yes, it will. Pleasure, John. There is breaking news now in New York City, and we've just learned that federal authorities have now arrested a man they say was plotting to attack the Federal Reserve Building in Lower Manhattan, just blocks from the World Trade Center site. Not plotting to attack it, but tried to blow it up this morning. Or that's the word from authorities. Here's what we know. The suspect apparently raised some red flags after he posted on, online some stuff about jihad or holy war. Uh, here's how we think this went down. This Middle Eastern guy starts saying stuff. Uh, an informant or an FBI guy gets in touch with him. Uh, the FBI agent then met him, and the guy believed that the FBI agent was not an FBI agent, but an accomplice. Got him all this stuff together. Uh, the suspect and the FBI agent planned a fake attack for months. And this morning it went down. Let's get the details of how it went down. Rick Leventhal's in the newsroom. Rick? Shepard, the suspect is a Bangladeshi national who, according to the FBI, traveled to the U.S. in January for the sole purpose of carrying out a terrorist attack, uh, allegedly wanted to destroy America, in his own words. And what he did was go online to try and recruit others to form a terror cell. And one of the people that he recruited was an undercover FBI agent who this suspect apparently thought was, in fact, someone who also wanted to commit a terrorist act. And this undercover FBI agent supplied this Bangladeshi national with 20 50-pound bags of what was supposed to be explosive material. And this morning, they put that 1,000 pounds of material in a van and drove together to Lower Manhattan and parked outside the New York Federal Reserve Bank on Liberty Street, where this suspect allegedly believed that he was about to blow up a 1,000-pound bomb. He had a detonator. He had worked for months to assemble this, uh, uh, this fake bomb that he uh, allegedly thought was real. He went to a hotel nearby with this FBI informant, and the two of them uh, were together when this suspect allegedly tried to detonate the bomb with a cell phone and recorded a video, which the FBI apparently has, uh, stating his reasons for trying to carry out this terror attack. So this attack uh, never would have happened because the bomb itself was fake thanks to the, the, uh, the participation of this FBI agent who was acting undercover, Shepard. All right, Rick Leventhal, stay with us. We've just gotten a statement from prosecutors. Jonathan Hunt has that. Uh, Shep, this is from uh, FBI Acting Assistant Director Mary Gallagher. She says, quote, attempting to destroy a landmark building and kill or maim untold numbers of innocent bystanders is about as serious as the imagination can conjure. The defendant faces appropriately severe consequences. It is important to emphasize that the public was never at risk in this case because two of the defendants two of the defendant's accomplices were actually an FBI source and an FBI undercover agent. She concludes, the FBI continues to place the highest priority on preventing acts of terrorism. Jonathan, thanks. So here's what we know. This morning, after months and months of planning, according to authorities, the guy who's a Middle Eastern man and came over here with, as Rick reported, the sole intention of, of uh, destroying America, took a van full of something that he thought was something else, took it downtown next to the Federal Reserve Bank, had a cell phone through which he was going to trigger it, dial the number, waited for it to go boom, and instead of it going boom, the authorities came and arrested him. Sounds like a major, major thing, doesn't it? Fox News senior judicial analyst is here, Judge Andrew Napolitano. Uh, this sounds familiar. Yes, it does sound very familiar. Uh, this this uh, process that the FBI goes through of finding people who have expressed a hatred for the United States or of American institutions and a willingness to attack them. And that, then the FBI engages them via one of its own agents, typically, pretending to be a Confederate and walks them through uh, the crime. The, the crime, of course, is something that would have been impossible to have accomplished because there was never any uh, bomb material there. So there's, there's, I would suggest there's two ways to look at it. One is, this is a guy with very evil intention who on his own traveled from Pakistan to come to the United States, expressed a hatred and antipathy to our institutions and a willingness to destroy them. And if the FBI had not engaged him in this, he would have been free to engage on his own in some act of terror that would have harmed people. The other way to look at it is 
This is the 18th person since 9-11 that the FBI has found and persuaded to go along with a plot that it created, it controlled, and that never endangered anybody. How do they find people? The American public has to make a determination. Do they want FBI agents looking for crazies and weak people among us and leading them to believe they're going to commit a crime? Because these people end up going to jail for the rest of their lives. This will be, and he'll probably, probably be convicted, because the FBI probably taped everything he did, audio uh, and video. This will be the 18th such person that the FBI has taken off the streets using this method. Is it a good thing, or is it pushing the limits of what the law enforcement should be doing? And that is the question. This morning, the feds are said to have watched as a man dialed the phone which was to be the detonator and in his mind at least at that moment when he finished dialing the phone and it rang on his end America would be forever changed think of it if the Federal Reserve Bank in Manhattan had blown up this morning where would our economy be at this moment of course it was never going to happen did the FBI create this or did the FBI help to stop this it's breaking news coverage and it continues after this. Continuing coverage from New York City and word that a man is now in custody after the FBI says he tried to blow up the uh, Federal Reserve Bank in Manhattan this morning, thought he was blowing it up just blocks from the World Trade Center site. He raised red flags about a jihad posting, then the FBI got with him. The FBI made him think that they were, well, in on it with him, but they were not. Rick Leventhal with some new information on intent from our newsroom. Rick? Yeah, the suspect, his name is Quasi Mohammed Rezwanul Hassan Nafis. He's 21 years old. He uh, has been charged with attempting to use a weapon of mass destruction and attempting to provide material support to Al Qaeda. Uh, according to the FBI, in a video statement that he made uh, just prior to trying to detonate this bomb, he said, We will not stop until we attain victory. Or martyrdom. Uh, they say, according to the U.S. attorney, the defendant came to this country intent on conducting a terrorist attack on U.S. soil and worked with single minded determination to carry out his plan. The defendant thought he was striking a blow to the American economy. Shepard. Wow. Rick Leventhal in the newsroom. Judge Napolitano, he thought. Essentially, he thought, he thought. Correct, correct. Essentially, he is being punished or, or will be prosecuted and probably incarcerated for the rest of his life because of his thoughts. If well, there were actions this morning. There was a cell phone. There was a driving of a van. There was a video made. Correct. If, if crime is defined as harm, then the question is who was harmed by this? Actually, the taxpayers were harmed because the FBI uh, consumed resources dealing with this character, knowing that he wasn't going to hurt anyone. Again, that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is the government believed that he was determined to do this at some point in his life, and that's the reason he spent his own money to come here. So in order to assure that he would never harm anybody, they brought him into this trap so that he'd be, go away for the rest of his life, and as a result, we are all safer. It, it's just two ways to look at what the FBI has done. But this will not be argued before a jury. The evidence of him has been captured on, on, as we know, audio and videotape. The case is tied up with a bow on it and presented to the uh, U.S. attorney. He'll probably plead guilty sometime in the next couple of months. Naysayers would say, well, rather than facilitating this, making him think you're helping him with this, why not watch him, see, see who he brings together, and see what he's actually willing to do. I'm that, I, nobody is passing judgment on anything here except to say there's more than one way to look at everything that happens. So, sometimes the FBI will do that. If they believe that he has Confederates, they will watch him to see if there are other people involved with him, people pro providing him material support in the United States or elsewhere. And then they can arrest his, uh, his colleagues. Uh, here, it's just him and an, and an FBI agent pretending to be his buddy. Judge, thanks. Welcome. We'll be right back. He is accused of murdering thousands of Americans on September the 11th, 2001. And now, with the judge's blessing, he's being granted a wish. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed allowed to wear an American-made camouflage vest in court like a member of the U.S. military. And rant. The decision leaving the families of 9-11 victims seething, I think all Americans seething. So why did the judge do it? Joining us right now, our judge, Fox News senior judicial analyst Andrew Napolitano. Judge, I'm, did, he, this, did this guy screw up? Well, I'm laughing because I don't know why the judge did this. It's, it's a real head scratcher. I can't even think of a reason why a military judge would permit this. And in, in, in fact, 
This judge wrote a, an opinion, a, a seven-page opinion, mm -hmm. stating his reasons. The opinion is a classified document for 15 days. So the week after next, when this is all history and we're talking about the election returns, this opinion will be right. released. A as a practical matter, because this is a military court and because the jurors are active-duty military and because the judge is full-time active-duty military, I don't think that his his attire, his garb in the courtroom, mm -hmm. is going to affect the outcome of the case. But I can understand how families of victims are furious Absolutely. about this because, aside from this awful beard, he, he will, in some respects, resemble an American uh, member sure. of the military in that courtroom. And you know, one of the things, uh, Judge, from the get-go is uh, the fact that you know they said you got to try these terrorists in a military tribunal because you know they don't get the same rights because they're not a member of any army they don't wear a uniform here we're putting them in a uniform part of his uh, defense we now know this from the oral argument that was made by his lawyers over this issue of the uniform is going to be when I was fighting the Russians in Afghanistan in the 80s the American military gave me an American military uniform and I wore it I don't think that's even, even a defense, even remotely, to what he did on 9-11, but he's going to make this argument, because how do we know? Because he made that argument to justify wearing into the court. Judge, under the old rules, the Bush rules, he had admitted guilt, he wanted to die, he was being fast-tracked. Then they put it all on hold, they try to bring him to New York City, and then they bring back these other rules. It's going to take us another year to put him on trial. You're, you're exactly right, and I understand your frustration, and I think most people share your frustration, Brian. And, and not to give you more agita, but the, the view that you have of this was given another setback earlier this week when uh, Mossama bin Laden's driver's conviction was reversed by a federal appeals court because the crime for which he was for which he pleaded guilty, there was no trial, for which he pleaded guilty, according to the federal appeals court, was not a crime at the time he is alleged to have done it. E even, even though these are, these are uh, inappropriate and criminal acts everywhere in the world. And he's got rockets in his trunk, and he was Bin Laden's <laughs> driver and passed the Bin Laden background check. That should be life or death. He has sued the American government twice, and both times he's prevailed, once before the Supreme Court. You are getting me so angry. Only in America. I'm just trying to tell you the truth, <laughs> Brian. I know this is going to ruin I can't death. handle the truth. <laughs> 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 Where have I heard that? Yeah, before? Right. <laughs> Judge, thank you very much. We'll see you later. Bless your guys.